And over the course of the last few years, the more I've learned about gardening, the more I've learned about the importance of bugs. Bugs can make or break your veggie patch, your fruit trees, your backyard orchards, your edible forest gardens. So today I'd like to share with you some of the insights that I've learned about bugs. And I think that the most important thing for me to notice is time. I think for most of you backyard gardeners who are spending every day or every second day in your garden, you don't notice things changing as much. And I think through our services, we, we run an urban farming service where we go into people's backyards and we grow their vegetables and tend their fruit trees for them. And we tend to visit every two, three or four weeks. And that time scale seems perfect to watch and observe the intricacies of nature and bugs. So I'm going to share a few insights with you today. So I'm guessing most of you here are here because you've had problems with pests and things in the garden before. And I suspect that some of you have heard of the terms good bugs and bad bugs. So the idea being that some bugs are beneficial in the garden and they do good things. And other bugs are perhaps not so beneficial in the garden and, and, and damage our plants or our fruits uh, and cause all kinds of issues. So first up, I thought I'd test you all and I'm gonna ask for a bit of audience participation here because I'm going to need some people to help hold up some cards. Test you all about which, which bugs are good and which bugs are bad. So the first one, I've got a white fly. Ooh. Bad? Okay, do you want to come up here and hold that, please, on the, the bad side? Do you know why white fly are bad? Okay. So she said she's been told they're bad and they congregate, but she doesn't know why they're bad. Okay, next one. Lacewing. Good. Do you want to come and hold that on the good side then? And do you want to just come over this way for a second? Do you know why they're good? Yeah, and they, the larvae eat aphids, I think. Beautiful. Yep, the larvae eat aphids. White cabbage moth. Bad? Okay, do you want to hold that on the bad? Sorry, you wanted to take notes, didn't you? <laughs> I'll let you sit down soon, I promise. Uh, any idea why white cabbage moth are bad? They destroy their broccoli. Codling moth. Good or bad? Why are coddling moth bad? Yes, that, that bit is poo. Yes, the coddling moth burrows into the apple and makes it very, uh, well, less, less palatable looking. Aphid? Bad? Do you want to come and hold that on the bad side then, please? Do you know why they're bad? Yes, they suck the leaves. It's got lots on the bad side at the moment. Snail? Snail, anyone? Good? Bad? bad? Nobody else wants to say anything because they don't want to stand up here, do they? <laughs> Petra, you look like you want to stand on the bad side with the snails. I've only got a few to go, don't miss out. Parasitic wasp? Good. Why is the parasitic wasp good? They lay them up in other bugs that eat them from the inside out. Yep, so the answer was they lay their larvae inside other bugs and then eat them from the inside out. Spider? Good. Good? Who said good? Do you want to come and hold that on the good side then, please? Why are the spiders good? Okay, so they're excellent. They eat all kinds of bugs and things. Honeybee? Good. Do you want to hold that one as well then? Because I don't know if we're going to get too many more volunteers. So the honeybees pollinate. Hoverfly. Good. Good. Can we have an extra? Or well, you can hold hold that one with the lace wings. Do you know what the hoverfly does? You said. Uh, some kind of larvae as well, right? Yep. Larvae eat the um, the aphids and things. And let's go with two more. Earwig. Bad. 
Everyone agree? Are you each bad? Do you want to hold bad then, please? This will all make sense in a minute, I promise. And praying mantis. Good? We got. And praying mantis is another generalist predator. Okay, so we've got lots of bad bugs in our garden and not many good bugs. So now I want you to think a bit about how all those animals interact. Lots of those bugs here, the, the good bugs that we were speaking about, are predators. They eat things. And they generally eat things that are on this side. The things on that, that side are also eating things. Everything in nature at some point is a consumer. It usually starts out as a consumer. And then it ends up being consumed by something. It's a food web. So that's quite important. So I want you to think about, uh, let's, let's completely make this so that everyone can understand without knowing what all the bugs are. I want you to imagine that we've got a big glass box. And inside the box we've got lots of lettuces. Now, if we put inside that, that glass box with lots and lots of lettuces, two rabbits, what happens? We start off with two. So if, if we imagine that this is a graph, and we've got time along the bottom, and population, so the number of animals within the box, starts off as two, pretty quickly becomes, what, six, and multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and multiplies exponentially. Assuming there's unlimited lettuces in the box. Now, so imagine your rabbits are a bit like some of your bad bugs that are over here. Your aphids, your white fly and so on. What happens when we put a fox in the box? All of a sudden, rather than going straight up, or if we put two foxes in the box rather, they start eating the rabbits. So instead of going straight up, as the, the foxes breed up eating rabbits, the population of rabbits starts to plateau a bit. But then once the foxes get to a certain point, they start eating more rabbits than are being consumed. So the population of rabbits starts going down. As the population of rabbits starts going down, there's less food available to the foxes. So the foxes, pretty soon after, start to follow suit. With me so far? As the levels of foxes goes down, the levels of rabbits can start to go up again. Which then means that the foxes can follow suit. And basically, assuming that the, the number of lettuces is, is unlimited in the box, nature will do this. And they'll stay in relative balance to each other. Now, what happens if we've got this scenario here and we come out one day and we go, oh my goodness, I've got a lot of rabbits eating all my lettuces. And we decide we're going to spray, or in this case, release myxomatosis or Khaleesi virus or something, and we kill all our rabbits. We go back to zero, or probably two, because you never get rid of them all. All of a sudden, there's nothing to support the foxes. So our foxes drop down in number as well. So we have very few rabbits and very few foxes. But then over time, the rabbits start to build up. And we notice that the rabbits have built up, so we release our Khaleesi virus again, and we have nothing. And we just keep doing that over and over again. Every time we unleash pesticides on the garden, and we never give the foxes a chance to breed up our good bugs. So if you take that and extrapolate that to all of our, our good bugs and bad bugs, you'll start to see that, hey, maybe these, these bad bugs aren't so bad after all, because if we don't have any bad bugs in the garden, we don't have any good bugs in the garden. What we really want was that balance that I showed. 
of, of populations just fluctuating in and out of balance rather than massive peaks and troughs, troughs of things. So thank you very much, team. You can sit down now. If you can just keep in mind all of those, those bugs that were on either side. So sometimes some of those bugs that, that we had listed as bad bugs, not only they provide food for good bugs, but they often do things other than what we expect them to. I'll use our friend Earwig, the example. Earwigs are the great decomposers of our gardens. We just get frustrated when they decompose plants that we want growing in the garden. But they'll happily help you break down your compost. They actually eat codling moth eggs as well. So we had over here, a, on, a, on this side, a codling moth was one of our pests, but this guy actually reduced those numbers of pests. So while sometimes they do damage that we don't want them to do, often they're doing a lot more good in the garden than we anticipate. Things like... So the honeybee's a good pollinator, we knew that one. There's another one that, that's often maligned the European wasp. Would you say that's a good bug or a bad bug? Bad? Most people say it's bad because it's introduced. The last two years, I've had a lot of fun because I'm a bit weird like that. I get out in the garden. Mobile phones these days take incredible video footage and, and, and photo footage. I just sit there zooming in on, on little bugs. There's whole ecosystems happening on your plants. I'm going to pass this photo around for people to have a look. I'll pass one out each side. I've actually filmed European wasps going in and attacking white cabbage moth and eating them. They're actually, at this time of the year, actively getting in around your brassicas, dragging the white cabbage moth larvae out, eating them and taking them back to the nest. So something that we assume is bad often is doing good things behind the scenes. So. I alluded briefly to a, a food web, and that should be a, a concept that's familiar to most of you in that everything is, consume, uh, is a consumer but also gets consumed. And you, you think maybe of the ocean where you've got shellfish at the bottom and then fish as they get bigger slowly up towards sharks at the top. Now you'll find within any, any system, that food web actually looks a bit like a, a pyramid. So things at the bottom of the chain, there tends to be a lot bigger biomass. So that's not necessarily numbers, because obviously a small fish is a lot smaller than a shark. But if you actually multiply the size of the small fish by the actual number, there's a lot more actually combined weight of all those small fish at the bottom of the food chain through to the top, the apex, which might be a shark. They're a lot bigger, but there's a hell of a lot less of them. So in your garden, those small creatures, you know, we start worrying about possums and the other bigger things in your garden, really comes down to these smaller things is where you want to pay the most attention because they've got the most potential for damaging your plants and things like that as well. So going back to the, the rabbit and the fox, we spoke about there being unlimited let lettuces in the box. Now, that's never going to be the case in, in our gardens. Gardens are a lot more complex than a glass box with three species in it, lettuces, rabbits and foxes. So there's always a, that, that very simplified ebb and flow is always going to be dis, distorted a bit. But the, in any garden when the food is limited, that become, becomes another rate limiting factor on growth. And that's especially important when you're starting to talk about possums, which is one thing that I get called about pretty much the most, is possums. And I unfortunately don't have any solutions for how to stop possums marauding your garden, but maybe I'll help you understand why they maraud your garden. I mean, you can start coming up with some clever ideas of, on how to um, prevent them. So possums are obviously an indigenous Australian animal. And you might have noticed that in Australia, we don't have many deciduous trees. So our possums have grown up on evergreen, mostly eucalypt trees. And the eucalypt tree is not necessarily full of nutrition for it. It's a pretty coarse, tasteless 
well, it's actually full of flavour. I consider it to be quite a bitter flavour. But the possum's growing up on that. It's been quite a staple diet for it. But what we've done, especially in the eastern suburbs, is we've ripped out all of our indigenous native trees and we've planted deciduous trees. So if we look at the volume of food that's available to the possum, it's used to having eucalypt trees that are pretty stable throughout the year. So thinking that that's the volume of leaves over time. But with our deciduous trees, we know that in summer at this time of the year, there is a lot of leaves and they're a lot more nutritious for the possum. They're like chocolate, like junk food for a possum. But then what happens in autumn, they start taking all the nutrients out of the leaves, going back down into the trunk of the tree, and the leaves become a bit like cardboard to a possum, and then eventually the leaves fall off. So there's no food for the possum. Then what happens in spring, the deciduous trees leaf out, and the possums all of a sudden go, oh wow, there's lots of food. And when animals tend to have lots of food available and nutrients available to them, they start to breed. And possums breed like the rabbits in our box. They have, they've evolved with trees that are quite stable, so they don't understand or they haven't quite evolved to work out that actually this deciduous tree is not going to support their population that they're growing in winter. So they keep breeding. So the possum population, rather than being fairly... So this is with our eucalypt trees, the possum population stays fairly stable. But with our deciduous trees, let's get a different colour. Uh, let's start the possum population here. Possum population starts breeding up and up and up and up and up and it keeps going. And then all of a sudden, all the leaves fall off the tree. And our population numbers have got much higher than our, our native trees would have sustained. And all of a sudden, there's all these rampant possums looking for food. And I get the phone calls about the possums are marauding my garden the most in autumn. Which further leads to the evidence of why I think that's the case. So I don't have any solutions for how to stop the possums. Just maybe think about planting more native trees into your gardens. Yes, they mightn't give you food, and I know we're an edible gardening business, but there's lots of reasons to do that. Our big trees have another uh, benefit to them. They provide nesting habitat for the possum's only predator, which is the owl. And the owls, our, our indigenous owls, don't tend to like the deciduous trees so much. They like the native trees that we have. So by cutting down all our native trees, we've had a double-fold effect. The other reason why possums are growing in numbers is because we're providing a lot more nesting sites. Our houses are getting bigger and bigger with lots more nooks and crannies in them, which has a lot more nesting sites for the possums. So we're creating this perfect storm for ourselves in Melbourne with possums, yet we sit here and blame the possums for the problems that we've created. So we've, we've spoken about what are good bugs and what are bad bugs. Now I want to talk a bit more about garden design and how we can encourage more good bugs. And let's, let's try and get away from that good bug and bad bug. Hopefully I've started to convince you now that there's no such thing as a bad bug. There's just bugs. Diversity. And if you're talking about nature, you're talking about biodiversity. So the more diversity of organisms you can have in your garden, the more stable and resilient it will be. If you only have aphids and whitefly, then you're going to have that, that similar population problem. But one, if you've got a very diverse group of bugs in your backyard, if one bug isn't there, like your lacewing or your praying mantis, another bug like the spider will step up and control the problem for you. You want a, a residual population of army ready there to breed up when a food source becomes available. So let's talk a bit about how we ensure we've got that good army, resident army, sitting in our garden ready to go for when a, a white fly or an aphid turns up. And the first, the first thing I can say is, is flowers. So we all know flowers are good for the bees, and bees are really essential for pollination. This, um, mint, this is just common garden mint that just goes to seed at this time of the year. I bought this in, not because it's looking so ratty, but because it's covered in flowers. And unfortunately, because it's in the shade, it's not covered in bees at the moment, but in my garden last week, it was swarming with bees as with some of the other plants that I've brought up on stage. But the key to, you know, we, we're talking about flowers. Now, why would flowers help our predatory bugs? And our predatory bugs, they eat aphids, they eat white, white flies. So what's the point of putting flowers in the garden for the predatory bugs? And the key is, is the life cycle of a, of a bug. 
So most bugs that we're talking about in the garden are insects. So I'm going to hand around this chart for people to have a look at. And insects go through a life cycle. So on that chart, it's a cycle, so it doesn't have a start or an end, but I'm going to start with the egg. And this is the same for lacewings, this is the same for ladybugs, um, praying mantis, all of those sort of things, hoverflies. Start with an egg that hatch out as a larvae stage. So with a, lar uh, with a lacewing, it's an antlion. With a ladybug, it's a little, it looks a bit like a dragon crawling around. And that larvae is what does all the good damage in the garden. So the larvae sit there and a late, an ant lion will eat 60 aphids an hour on a lace wing. So that larvae usually doesn't have wings. It's an insect, so it's got three segments, six legs, and some little pincers that it goes around and some antennae. And it goes around eating, 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 and doing lots of good stuff in the garden. Then, like any insect, butterflies included, oops, it forms usually a chrysalis or a cocoon, something like that, and it pupates. So let's do a nice big drawing of our cocoon. And then after it's pupated, it emerges. as a butterfly, as a lacewing, as a ladybird. Can anyone think what's the key characteristic of all of those? It has wings. And that, the adult usually, eats pollen. So there's two key things to learn about those adults. They eat pollen and they have wings. If you don't feed them pollen, they're gonna fly elsewhere. And then when they're elsewhere, they're gonna to go to the next stage of their life cycle and lay their eggs, which means that their larvae are not in your garden where, they, where you need them to be. So that's the main reason why we include flowers in the garden. Now, what sort of flowers? And that all comes down to the actual mouth part of the animal. So you think about, we include a lot of flowers for bees and butterflies. Butterflies have that big, long proboscis on them. So they get down into tubular plants. Well, all of our wood bugs that we talk about, our lacewings and our ladybugs, actually have really short mouth parts, really tiny little pinches. Then that's to go around and eat all the aphids and things. But once they've, they've gone through their metamorphosis, they still have short mouth parts. So they need pollen that they can readily access. So you don't want pollen big down in long fluted flowers. You want nice compound flowers, like this tansy. So that's actually got lots and lots of little flowers there, lots of pollen that's easy to access. The mint is fairly easy, the, the flowers, the pollen within the flowers there are fairly easy to access this perennial basil over here. All of these plants are fantastic to include in your garden. Uh, things like your echinacea or cone flowers, anything from the daisy family usually. So, yes? Yes, well, all male flowers. Some flowers have both male and female parts. So if you look at your curcubits, your pumpkins and cucumbers and things, they have a male and a female flower. Only the male flowers will have pollen, uh, but they're, they're not what I'd really be planting for beneficial insects. So I've got a handout with a couple of different flowers on there just to give you an idea of you know, calendulas, Queen Anne's lace, what else have we got here? Passion fruit marigold, yarrow. And you don't have to specifically plant flowers. You can think about things like carrots. So Queen Anne's lace, which is fantastic for beneficial insects, it'll be covered in ladybug larvae and things. Another name for Queen Anne's lace is false carrot. And funnily enough, if you let your carrot go to seed, the flower looks exactly the same. So plant out all your carrots, and yes, at some point in summer, they're gonna bolt and go to seed. Don't rip them out, let them go. Let your parsley go to seed, let all of those flower, those um, veggies go to seed. 
they're going to feed the good bugs, then they're going to drop their seed, and then you'll have next year's crop. So it's actually, rather than going out and going to the big green box and buying lots of pesticides and spraying, you're actually, by doing nothing, by being completely lazy, you're controlling your bug population, and you don't have to plant next year's crop. Pollen's going to feed lots of insects, so diversity. So thinking about you're going to get a more, you might not attract necessarily the target bugs that you want, but often you don't know what, what bugs are doing. I, I heard the bee people speaking before, and I didn't know this, but they're actually releasing earwigs into their beehives now to control the varroa mite. So yes, you'll be attracting some sort of bugs in to feed on the pollen because you, nature doesn't like an unused resource. Everything that was once living is a resource and it will be consumed. A tree, when it dies, starts to rot and the fungi breaks it down. You're creating a niche. It's the same as when you plant out a garden. This is probably drawing a long bow, but plant out a garden and we mulch it and we leave all these bare patches. And then wonder why the weeds turn up. Well, that's because we created a niche. There's, there's nutrients there, there's water there, and there's light there for a plant to grow so it will grow. That pollen is a niche. Something will eat it. And the fact that something is eating it is a good thing. Even if it's a bad bug, it's going to feed good bugs down the track. So I take on board your comment about, yes, sometimes they're not as aesthetic. Yep. That, that could be an issue that I would see, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. So another thing you want to avoid doing is, is monocultures. So we talked about biodiversity. So don't go and plant out big blocks of the same thing because that's creating one big food source for something. Avoid planting in your veggie patch. There's an example of, and I've planted out both, once in my younger days and another more recently how we plant out our gardens. There's one here, a veggie patch with nice neat rows and one that's very scattered with a big diverse planting of plants all I was going to say it looks random, but it is random. And the advantage of planting out a garden like that is if you get a bug like a white cabbage moth that likes, we got, no, we don't have any brassicas there, but if you get a bug that, that happens to like a particular plant, it starts at the end of the row and it just chomps all the way through to the other end of the row. But if you put barriers of other plants that it doesn't like in between, so it's got to spend a lot of energy getting from one plant to the next, it's more chance it'll get picked off by a bird. It encourages biodiversity, so you're going to have a, a more diverse group of bugs there. Uh, it also creates more wildlife habitat for them. So I'll pass these images around for you to have a look. So thinking about how you physically place your plants in the garden. So really good design can help reduce the impact of bugs in the garden. So uh, bugs and, and pests. So possums is a great example for one. We plant, you know, usually nice espaliered fruit trees and things all along the fence. Well, I often get people calling me up about, oh, I've planted a petostrum hedge along the fence. And then I, I, I colloquially call fences possum highways because that's the way they get around yards. And then so we put these food sources right next to their highways and wonder why they get eaten. So just thinking about how you design a garden Maybe because you need to design access paths in and things, put the access path right next to the fence. So you've actually got a metre and a half gap or a metre gap between the fruit trees and the fence. Possums, not, possums hate going down to ground level. So they're not going to come down to ground level. They'll only come down to ground level in autumn when their deciduous trees have lost all their leaves and they're really, really hungry. They're, they're at risk of being eaten by dogs and all kinds of things when they come down to ground level. So by putting in that barrier between your fruit trees and the fence, you're actually going to stop a lot of the problems and they'll keep walking along the fence and go to your neighbour's fruit trees that are a lot more easily accessible. A really great idea in your garden design is to include a water feature of some sort. Most living things require water. Putting a pond in can encourage frogs. Frogs are great consumers of bugs. Uh, but lots of things like dragonflies and bees all need water as well. Keeping that water on site means they don't have to fly out of your garden to go and find water, which means there's less 
chance of them not coming back to your garden. Habitat is a really important thing for our bugs. They're not eating all the time. And also for, for some of the things that eat our bugs. Microbats are incredible consumers. They consume their body weight each night in insects flying around. So putting in a, a microbat nesting area, they, they're specifically designed boxes that you need for them to live in. It means you'll have some resident microbats that'll be flying around. But thinking about other types of habitat, a lot of beneficial insects and things love nesting in grasses and kind of those wavy type plants like sugarcane over the back here. But including lots of, you know, it could be indigenous plants like kangaroo grass, it could be lemongrass, any of those sort of things as wildlife habitat will attract lizards and things like that which will also help keep your bug populations under control and stop those big spikes. Mowing grass, for those of you, has anyone here got lawns? Is anyone going to willingly admit to having lawns? Great. And is it at a nice kind of Sir Walter or one of those cooch grasses or is it covered in clover and all kinds of dandelions and things like that? Great. Because all of those things have those flowering plants that we like. But the problem you have is normally you get really excited on a Saturday morning and you start up the lawnmower and you go and mow the whole lot. Which means your, your bugs that have been lovingly growing up and breeding up with all of this lovely pollen have gone from having a massive habitat and food to nothing in the space of an hour. So think about how you mow it. And yes, I know it's a bit more work, but maybe mow alternate sections each week. Mow the front yard and then mow the backyard, or mow half the backyard and then the other half the next week. I know it's a pain in the backside, but if you want a more resilient garden, that will make a big difference. <laughs> Timing of planting can be a really important one, especially when you're focusing on, on vegetables. For three years running, we planted out for our clients brassicas. Brassicas traditionally in, in Melbourne are planted out on St Patrick's Day in March. So when I talk about brassicas, I'm talking about broccolis, cabbages, cauliflowers, things like that. And that's what the white cabbage moth loves to eat. Now, broccoli will grow at any time of the year and you can plant broccoli right now and it will happily grow. But what you'll find is if you plant a broccoli seedling now, it will be gone in a week because the white cabbage moth will have laid its eggs and the caterpillar will have eaten the whole thing. So we'd madly go around in March planting out all our brassicas because that's what you do. And then we'd come to our clients the next visit three weeks later and all our crops would be gone. We'd scratch our heads and we'd sow another lot of seeds and we'd plant them all out again in April or early May, late April, early May. And lo and behold, those crops for three years running survived just fine. So guess what? We don't plant brassicas in March anymore. And the reason why they're susceptible is, is that a lot of bugs, including the white cabbage moth, really thrive in mild conditions. Usually in spring and autumn, when temperatures are in those mid-twenties, with a bit of rainfall around, usually promotes lots of lush green new growth, and the bugs really start to breed up. But once you start getting to April and May, we get some colder nights, and that really slows the bugs down. So they're still going to be there, but they're not going to be there in the same numbers. So really thinking your way around the timing of your crops can make a huge difference to when pests attack your crops. Avoiding sprays, so we spoke a bit, bit about that and I gave you the demonstration of why we don't spray in the garden because it's not only killing the bad bugs, it's also killing the good bugs. I've also noticed that using extra strong fertilisers in the garden can, can cause some spikes in bug populations. So nitrogen, uh, for those of you that are really into your gardening, not, will know that nitrogen creates leafy growth in plants strong leafy growth. Now if you put lots of nitrogen on a plant it will grow really really quickly. The problem with that is, and it's the problem that we have with all of our, our major food production, is that that really fast growth with lots of nitrogen means the plants don't assimilate lots of other things like calcium and iron to the same levels. So the plants aren't actually as nutrient dense. Now a lot of those nutrients are important for building up the plant's defences. So calcium is incorporated into a cell wall, makes the cell wall stronger, makes the plant a bit more tough, which means it's a bit more chewy to the bug, so it's probably going to slow it down a bit. But when we feed it with lots of nitrogen, it makes a junk food plant for your bug, and your bug grows really, really quickly. If you, if you actually are really interested in this, go out and buy a refractometer and start measuring the nutrient density of your food. 
you'll measure your supermarket tomatoes versus your homegrown ones and you'll never buy a supermarket tomato again. Um, so instead of lots of really rich fertilizers, build your healthy soil. So focus on good quality composts that incorporate a lot more of those, those different nutrients. Try not to grow super fast food, grow slow food. It will be a lot better for you and it will have a lot less pest um, problems. And, an, and finally, your good design should also incorporate a bit of edible forest gardening into it. So edible forest gardening, and I'm doing a talk about this later on this evening, is about using a, a forest as a metaphor. So rather than, again, those nice strips and, and rows of, of plants and veggies, we're actually incorporating it into a very resilient, diverse ecosystem. Lots and lots of different plants, preferably lots of perennials, that have a, a lot of integrated habitat into it, lots of pollen for good bugs, and you'll find that that, that, that um, ecosystem will be far more resilient than a, a standard veggie patch, which is fairly labour intensive and fairly prone to the bugs. So I guess the take home message from all of this is to relax. So I want you all to go home, go and get a, a magnifying glass, wander around and start inspecting because you'll actually notice when you go and just look at one plant like this, and here's a bee flying around as promised, you'll start to notice a whole heap of different interactions happening. And once you start, go and get yourself a, a good quality book to help you identify the bugs. Because I, you might have noticed when we're going through the bugs, some people said, oh, I've just heard the bugs bad. Start looking at why they're bad. Start, start identifying them. You'll start getting a bit excited like me and go, oh, that's a, such and such a hoverfly or something like that. Start IDing them. It's a great activity for kids take photos of them, explore them. There's so much happening just on this one little flower head here, but we're so busy trying to control our landscapes that we're not actually seeing what's going on. So our flowers that are going to seed, I've nearly done it myself. Oh, that's gone to seed, that's no good. And then you actually look closely and there's aphids and then there's hoverfly larvae eating them and there's parasitic wasps flying around, injecting their eggs into the, the larvae so that the larvae all die eventually. You know, the, the white cabbage moth, you can take just take it off because it probably has been infected by a parasitic wasp already. Just put it down on the lawn or on a plant that you don't want it to eat because if you squish that, you've squished the parasitic wasp larvae as well. So just try to relax, enjoy the garden, spend more time observing it and less time trying to control it and manipulate it. You'll get so much more out of it. Now I'm not going to lie, yes your garden is going to look perhaps not as aesthetic as some nice neat hedges and things that you might see in Turak. Uh, but with lots of flowers, it'll certainly look good. You won't spend much energy on your garden, so you can spend more time relaxing. You're probably going to have a few failed crops because, yes, occasionally the pests and the, the, the good bugs and the bad bugs won't work it out. But if you haven't invested much energy in actually growing those crops, then what's the problem anyway? Just have fun watching it. Because I promise you, if, if, you, if you see this, this pest outbreak and you actually do relax enough, to step back, come back in two weeks' time and you'll find that, that pest outbreak will be covered in a swarm of some other bug that's turned up because it's a food source. Every pest outbreak is just a food source for the next outbreak of something. Okay, well, thank you very much for sharing your time with me today. I'm sure there's some questions. Thanks very much for your talk and it really makes a lot of sense. I wanted to ask you about cherry slugs. How do you control them? Okay, that's that's a bit of a loaded question for me because I wouldn't control them much. If you wanted to, and, and I presume you were asking about organic control methods, so there's a couple of things there. So a pear or cherry slug, if you're a cherry grower, it's a pear slug, and if you're a pear grower, it's a cherry slug. They're a little sawfly larvae. So they're at this stage of the life cycle and they get on and they eat the leaves back a bit. Now, there's a couple of ways that you could control them if you really wanted to. First of all, I would design into my garden a more diverse planting so that I didn't have lots of pears or cherries next to each other because they'll all start to breed up and you're almost creating a monoculture there. They overwinter in the soil so if you've got chooks in your system, chooks will scratch through the soil and start reducing their numbers. Occasionally when they get really bad and if I'm out wandering around the garden, I'll just squish them. So just a bit of manual control because I, you really don't want to go spraying around. The other way you can do it is with a fine powder like an ash, a wood ash or a lime. 
throw if you throw that on them. But that runs the risk of all sorts of other potential issues. Really, it, it would take a really bad outbreak of sawfly larvae um, or cherry or pear slug to kill a tree. It's, it looks ugly. I completely get that, and maybe that's just something that, as gardeners, we have to come to terms with. That yeah, we can have nice hedges and things, but it's not going to be as resilient. If you want a resilient garden, we need to start appreciating the beauty within that garden and start looking at it. Maybe look at the patterns that they eat into the leaves or something like that. Oh, has it been a problem so far? So the tree's fruiting well. That would be my recommendation. Just relax, and if it really is getting out of hand, as I said, just squish a few with your hand. But it's it's this thing that we have. Oh, there's aphids. I must kill. But why? You know, what are they actually doing? We just assume because we're told by the garden supplies people that we should buy this product. That we're, it's a problem that we've generated for ourselves. It's not really a problem. It's just nature. Any other questions? Okay, we've got two here. Uh, preventing fruit fly. Okay, preventing fruit fly. That's a whole new problem that's just arrived in Melbourne, a Queensland fruit fly. So, you know, if you drive up towards Shepparton Way, there's the big fruit fly exclusion. They've been there for decades. It's now actually made it to Melbourne. So fruit fly lays a, its egg underneath the skin of your fruit, usually stone fruit, tomatoes, all sorts of things, and the maggot crawls around and, and basically turns the fruit putrid. It's got the potential to be a huge problem for us. And it seems to be the thing that it, it likes is fallen fruit down on the ground. So we're really encouraging people now to, to not leave it. And this is probably where my do nothing gardening kind of clashes a bit because you really should be cleaning up that fruit at the moment to, to protect our, our larger industry areas. The other thing that you can look to do is this is exclusion netting, essentially. The fruit fly is small, but you can get some really fine netting to put over your trees, and I think that's probably going to be how we're going to have to look at dealing that sort of these sort of netted, netted enclosures, but with fruit fly. Now, that creates all sorts of issues of how do you get the pollinators in to pollinate your fruit, we're just finding out how bad this is going to be. There's pheromone traps, there's all sorts of ways that we're going to have to deal with it. A lot of it's probably to do with climate change and the fact that we're changing to a more subtropical climate in Melbourne, I think, is, is part of why it's coming down. And maybe we just need to start looking at planting things that the fruit fly don't infect. I don't know. I, I don't have all the full answers for you yet. It's going to be a big problem. We had another question up the back here. Citrus wasp galls. Does that gall damage the tree? Okay, gall wasp. I made a lot of enemies earlier in the year. <laughs> I posted a very controversial blog uh, because we're all told that we should prune out all of our galls in June. Prune in June. The idea being that, so in, on citrus trees, oh, actually I'll pretend that is still there. Uh, citrus trees, there's a little wasp called a gall wasp, tiny little black thing. It emerges, we were told, in August, uh, within a couple of days, it flies around, mates, within a couple of days, injects its eggs underneath the bark of the citrus tree, where it then sits there for about 12 months and pupates and emerges as a wasp to do it all over again. In the process of those eggs hatching and then the pupa forming underneath the, the bark, the tree creates kind of like an immune response and builds a woody gall around it. I noticed when we started pruning in June that it had a few effects on the tree. One being that as everything in nature, things need to be in balance. And when you prune it, any tree, you unbalance the tree from what's below the ground to what's above the ground. So what the citrus trees automatically try to do is grow a flush of new growth. So we were pruning in June, and by about 
October, November, the tree was covered in tasty new growth. What I've actually done is done a bit of research and I've started watching them and on our Facebook page, I actually got lots of people to start posting and watching their citrus trees. And we actually found, I think it was um, in November, there was a potential a particular date. And they've actually noticed that it's the temperature that, that causes all of the wasps to emerge pretty much at once across Melbourne. And when it gets to certain temperature, they all, and it, it's in, in the wasp benefit to all hatch at once, so they can all mate en masse. Not all of them are gonna get picked off and then they can reinfect the tree. The other thing I noticed about the trees were that they always infected the new growth. So what we were doing, we were pruning the trees in June, creating lots of new growth, and that, that the wasps weren't actually emerging when we thought they were, they were emerging a lot later and infecting all the new growth. So then we had a whole heap of new growth, the next year we cut it back, and each year our trees got smaller and smaller and smaller. So what I actually do is nothing now. Because, like our sawfly larvae, I've seen trees that are absolutely infested with gall wasps covered in lemons. I've noticed that they tend to infect lemons, grapefruit, um, and limes, to a lesser extent limes a bit more. They don't tend to infect oranges so much. So planting a different type of citrus. Avoid fertile, we're told we need to fertilize our trees spring, summer, and autumn. And the trees really do need that. They're a, they're a subtropical tree, they're not ideally grown in Melbourne. So we need to fertilize them quite regularly. But if we fertilize them in spring, like we're told, by the time October, late October, early November comes around, the tree's covered in a flush of new growth. So don't fertilize till December. The trees won't look as healthy. Yes, they'll have a few more goals in them than they should, but they'll still be productive. We, we assume that it's going to be a problem. They're a native wasp. They've come down from Queensland. Their predator will come down eventually, I'm sure. At the moment, it hasn't quite done. We're looking at a few other different things that you could do by working out the exact timing of the wasp. And this is where all of you can come in handy if we keep watching it year after year. We can predict when the wasps are going to emerge, put the netting over for the, for the couple of weeks that, that are, they're at risk, and then take the netting away, and all our, our trees should be wasp free. Does that answer your question? So, yeah, very contradictory because we're, we're told that we're a bad neighbour if we don't prune our trees in June. But does, does the gall wasp actually affect the quality of the fruit? Does the fruit deteriorate? In my opinion, no. It doesn't affect the fruit whatsoever. All it does is, I can understand that the tree's putting a bit more energy into growing those galls, but the trees usually are surviving quite well and probably in time it might overwhelm the tree, but a citrus tree has a productive lifespan of 30 years in Melbourne's climate. Yes, I've seen trees that are 80 and 100 years old, but generally speaking, they only last 30 years anyway. So you just want to have a succession plan in place, I think, anyway. But certainly, you can spend a lot of energy in pruning the tree and worrying about it, or you can just relax and eat the fruit. All right, I've been given the wind up. So I'm going to move back over near our veggie gardens over there and I'm more than happy to continue conversations over there with you all. Thank you very much for your time.